So energy prices has been expensive lately because of things happening in the world and there have been a lot of articles in the media about energy so I thought I, I'd make a video about the uh, energy grid and Mala Energy is responsible to distribute energy to the straws and some towns around here so here's a picture of the power plant so they use uh, garbage as fuel so you know, household garbage instead of just uh, putting in in piles they burn it and they turn the stored chemical energy in the garbage into electricity and here's a simplified image of the power grid you have producers here that push power into the backbone energy grid the organization responsible for the distribution network is Svenska Kraftnät uh, or SVK in short uh, and they distribute power between different regions and in my region it's uh, Vattenfall uh, that is responsible for the power and in one region there are several uh, local networks and one of the local networks is managed by Mela Energy and here in the end we have households industries uh, like for instance where I am now sitting and talking. So energy makes things move. For instance, if I move this base amplifier at the speed of one meter per second, if it had weighed one kilogram, um, the gravity constant that pulls things toward the center of Earth is not about 9.8. If you put it into the formula, you can find that uh, one lifting one kilogram, one meter per second is it requires 9.8 watts. And if you do the calculations and lift this motorcycle, which is a little bit over 230 kilograms, I think, it would require a thousand watts. Yeah, I think uh, the numbers are wrong. To lift 250 kilogram motorcycle at one meter per second is, when we put in the formula, 2450 watts. Approximately. So if I, if with one kilowatt, if I would lift this motorcycle for one hour, one meter per second at that speed, I could lift this motorcycle with one kilowatt hour, I could lift it 3,600 meters. So kilowatt hours is the unit we pay the, the electricity bills here in Sweden, and I think all of Europe. And I don't know what the unit is in the United States, but kilowatt hours is a standard unit, and it's now when the energy prices are high it costs about half a euro and usually with normal prices at least in sweden where we have lots of waterfalls it's about a tenth of that cost how does a reactor work that creates energy well, if you have read a course on thermodynamics you know that energy cannot be created and it cannot be destroyed it's one of the fundamental principles of thermodynamics but energy, it can be transformed. For instance, a waterfalls. In a waterfall, you could put a water wheel here. It's also a spin in the waterfall. And this spinning here could be transformed into electricity using a generator. So, but you are not creating energy. You are just taking energy that is already there in the waterfall. Taking some of that energy out and transforming it into electricity. So the turbine is a mechanism where the spinning thing is a rotor. The thing that's still around it is a stator, I think. If I would take the same amplifier here and fill it with water and then boil that water, it would the water would transform from liquid state into gas state. That's, that's called, of course called steam. Um, and the interesting thing here is that steam takes a thousand times more volume than water in a liquid state. So I think I could maybe fit 500 of these amplifiers in the garage. Well, if I would boil just one, boil just one amplifier of water using, for instance, this plate, it would extend a thousand times, so, but the garage can only hold 500 amplifiers 
So what happens is that garage would explode a lot and make a hole somewhere if it was airtight. If I would make a hole somewhere and put a pipe here in the hole that I created, the steam would have nowhere to go but out through this hole. And on the other side of the pipe, I could put a nozzle. The nozzle could hit the spinning uh, thing, <laughs> like a propeller. Uh, that's part of the turbine and create electricity. And as a fun fact, if you do it the other way, you can actually enter electricity into the generator and this axis will start to spin by itself. And that is the principle of an electric motor. So an electric motor and a generator is basically the same thing. And the principle of a plant that boils water. The fuel could be anything. It could be oil, it could be garbage, it could be nuclear. But the principle is the same. It boils water, forces the steam out, and this steam beam then makes this rotor spin and the generator converts it to electricity. There are losses when doing uh, power transmission, and those losses are when you power up the voltage, that's called step up transformation. Uh, that's one to two percent of the energy is lost. And you have two to four percent loss in the power lines. And then in the final distribution, you have, uh, I think, four to eight percent power loss. So in total, that's like eight to 15 percent of total power lost between the power plant and the consumers. Do the calculations and uh, look at the formula. You can see that the most important uh, variable is the voltage uh, that affects the amount of power loss. And that is uh, why you have high voltage when transforming lots of power. And then when you're closing in at the end consumer, you can have lower voltages because maybe you don't want 400,000 volts in your inside the neighborhood where kids are playing in the distribution network you have high voltage like 400 kilovolts because that's a lower loss and then uh, when you uh, are closing in on the end consumers like the wall outlet in your home the power is transformed from 400 kilovolts down to lower voltages in what's called a transformer substation and in the local network as close as possible to the home, you have a final uh, transformation that transforms it down to, in my case, 240 volts per phase. So the last transformation should be as close as possible to my wall outlet because the losses are high when the voltage is as low as 240 volts. And uh, talking about power lines, if you are really out on the countryside and you see some really, really old power lines, you might see uh, these old wooden poles with just two wires. And that means they are only transmitting power on one phase. The normal thing is to transmit power in three phases. Transmitting power on three phases, you need three wires. And with three wires, you can transmit three times as much power as with two wires. So you could imagine it would be economical to use three wires instead of two wires. And that is also why that is the case in new installations. A little bit from Swedish Kraftnät says VK uh, about power poles. Large power poles can also be called pylons. You usually have this truss construction and you have three phases here and you actually have more than one wire per phase here and that's because you can do three transmissions of three phases using only one set of poles. You can also find the poles with only one wire per phase. Up here you have the top, the top line and that's because if you have a, an electrical strike, a uh, lightning strike, you don't want the power to go into the wires here because that can cause errors. <laughs> you have lots of extra electricity. You don't want lots of ele extra electricity in the wires. So instead you, you can transmit the extra electricity from the lightning strike through the top line back to the substation. It starts to blow if there's a storm. So wind makes the lines go back and forth like this. Damper is here, trying to dampen this movement. The wires are not insulated, they only have a thin protective cover to protect against corrosion from rain and stuff. If you had a thick electric insulation around the wire, the heat wouldn't have anywhere to go. 
But because of that, uh, you can also you can get the flashover. And the higher the voltage is in the wire, the further the flashover can go. And you see these small disks here in the isolator chain. Well, it turns out, if you do the calculations, uh, that the flashover can travel about one disk per 15 kilovolts of power in the uh, wire here. And there are different types of these poles. This one is kind of shaped like an A, so that's called an A pole. And this one is called a B pole, but it's actually not shaped like a B, it's more shaped like a T, I guess. This is called an angle pole, because the wires here go at an angle. And uh, if they go straight here, the material here doesn't be have to be so strong because the wires are pulling in both directions, so they are kind of taking each other out, while here are not taking each other out because they are in an angle, so you have to have stronger legs on the poles here. Here in these poles, the wires are uh, vertically spaced, while in these poles, the wires are horizontally spaced. And the four shape here is kind of a Christmas tree, and they are actually called, at least in Sweden, Christmas tree poles. Um, and here is an end pole, that's the last pole before a stub station. Uneven force, so you have to have stronger legs on this one too. Well, I couldn't make a video like this without telling you some anecdote about Westeros. So here is uh, the Wikipedia page about the turbine house, the Binhuset in Westeros. It's this house here with a generator inside, and here under the bridge are water wheels, which uh, take up power um, from the Black River here, or Svartån in Swedish. And here to the side they have actually built this fauna passage now, so fish can swim upstream. 1884 was the first electric light in Westeros, and the first building was Westeros Cathedral. Uh, and a few years later, the turbine house was built. It sent electricity to the ASEA company, which made big business out of building uh, electricity stuff, like generators and turbines. And ASEA was, of course, later uh, combined with the Swiss company, Brown Bavaria, into ABB. If we go to Nordisk Family book here, you can see uh, to the left a picture of the old ASEA building, and to the right a large stator to a waterfall plant.